morning good morning good morning everybody this is um, another day that was not promised to us and we definitely want to be sure to tell the Lord thank you and so it is my prayer that you all have had a great weekend that um, things are well with you and if they're not I pray that after uh, we spend some time together in God's word this morning that uh, you will be encouraged. And so uh, let's go ahead and pray and then we will get into it. I want to shout out to the brothers for the great job um, last week. Uh, brothers, thank you for your consistency in um, our pursuit of truth, um, not truth just for the sake of saying, um, uh, puffing ourselves up, um, but truth for the sake of um, knowing God better. And so I uh, thank you uh, for that. Thank you to those that support us. If you will like, share, um, and if you have not subscribed to our YouTube page, please do so again as we continue to uh, pursue the truth of God's word and um, the truth for our lives. So let's pray, Father. Um, your word is already anointed, so Lord, we do not ask you to. Um, I don't ask you to speak. You're always speaking, and so I, I pray, Lord, that you um, would help us to position ourselves, Father. Sometimes when we cannot find the words to to say, God, sometimes we just need to say your name. And as the song said, Jesus, 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 God, there is so much um, in that name, the name that is above every other name, the name that is above all of creation, that is victorious over anything that we may face in this life. So, Lord, sometimes we don't need an elaborate prayer. Again, we just need to say your name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God, and I ask that you would bless this time. God, that we're able to hear clearly from your word what it is that you would have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, let me see here. Make sure everything's going on. <laughs> hey, B, good to see you. Um, if the Let me know if this is, if the con Things were kind of glitching. Um, so today we're going to be in Amos, Amos chapter four. And uh, before we get there, I want to open up in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, Proverbs, the fourth chapter, beginning at uh, verse 20. Last week, we talked about a, a never ending law, and that law was the law of reciprocity, right? Whatever you so that you shall also reap whatever you put in the ground at the right time 
it is going to come to fruition. And we saw that in how the Lord um, was choosing to deal with um, the Gentile nations that had oppressed the people of Israel along with um, others from um, Israel's family that had been in on the oppression as well. And so um, today we're going to deal with the question of where is your heart? Where is your heart? So let's go to verse 20 of Proverbs chapter four. And it says this, it says, my son, this is Solomon speaking to his boys. He says, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, he says, verse 23, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Above all, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life of life other translations say that everything that you do flows from the central place of your heart and again i want us to uh, spend some time dealing with the question of where is your heart and and one may um, quickly object and say well um I, I don't know why you're asking where my heart is uh, my heart belongs to the Lord. And if that is you um, today, we're going to see some things um, that you can use as a as a contrast to see um, is your feet moving in the same direction as your mouth is your feet moving in the same direction as your mouth. I, I really appreciate the book of Amos. Um, simply, I appreciate Amos's position because um, Amos, again, is just a sheep herder from the land of Tekoa, which, again, is about 12 miles um, away from the city. So uh, Amos, here he is minding his own business. And God speaks to him to say, uh, go and say these things to my people. So um, Amos is not caught between lines, right? He's not. Um, muddying the line of, well, one day he's in with the religious folk, one day he's not in with the religious folk, one day he's in with um, those who may be rebelling and those uh, one day he's in with those who are not rebelling. So, again, as we've stated already, Amos has no personal dog in this fight. What we're seeing from Amos is we're seeing a man to whom God has spoken to go tell the truth. That's it. To go tell the truth to his people, we're seeing him come from a platform that is unbiased. Again, he has no uh, ties to one party or the other. And I think that that's very important that we can learn from Amos is that we. We have to be distinct, right, as believers, there has to be something about us that when people see us, the first thing they don't associate um, based on how we live our lives, right, is that they can associate the fact that we belong to the Lord first in the things that we say and how we act. We belong to him first. So that when we open our mouths, it catches people's attention because it's not coming from a place of impure motives it's not coming from a place of a biased opinion what we speak how we interact with people how we live our lives what we put on display every single day should come from the truth and the heart of scripture not just the parts of the scripture that you like, but the whole canon of the Bible. That's where we should live from. So when people hear us again, it's not one of those moments of, oh, well, he's just saying that because he's with this group or she's just saying that because she belongs to this group. Right. No, we are literally trying and striving to live as close to the scriptures as possible. So that when people hear us, they hear him. 
when people see us, they see him. The problem is, is we have um, we have done a a dissection of the scriptures and we've only kept the pieces that we want um, or that we find that is relevant to us. We only want to keep the sections that support our our own motives or our own beliefs. Right. Right. Um, that that falls in line with whatever political party that you choose to follow or whatever leader you choose to follow. We pick and we choose and we dissect and we say, well, on this day, I'm going to live by this portion of the scripture. On this next day, I'm going to live by this portion of the scripture. And what we've done, ladies and gentlemen, is we've done an abysmal job of living as believers. And we have blurred the lines between what it looks like to actually follow Christ or to follow carnality. We've muddied the lines. And so I appreciate Amos and his position because he is not tied to one party or the other. He's simply minding his business. And when the Lord calls on him to speak, he goes and he opens his mouth. And that's a whole word in itself, right? May we be so busy minding our own business, focusing on the lot that God has given us in life. Whatever area, whatever arena that looks like for you, whatever it looks like proverbially for you to be tending to your sheep. May we be so focused on the area that God has us. That we're not caught up in all of the nonsense that's going on so that when he calls for us, right, we're ready to go speak. And then when he's done speaking, we go back to doing what it is that we were doing. Right. Minding our business that's not the word for the day but it's a great start all right okay so let's get into amos chapter four amos chapter four and again where is your heart i mentioned this last week and we'll we'll roll with this um as a subtopic under where is your heart and that is if you fail to heed his voice be prepared to experience his hand if you fail to heed his voice, be prepared to experience, excuse me, his hand. And what I mean by that is, is that if you fail to um, listen to the instruction of the Lord, if you fail to heed his word, if you fail to listen to the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is trying to get your attention before you make certain decisions um, at some point when you have overridden that voice long enough, when you have pushed that voice to the back of your head and you said, I'm not going to listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to do what it is that I want to do. I'm going to make the decisions that I want to make. When you do that enough, God as father decides to get involved and now you will experience his hand in your life and it is not the hand of blessing it is the hand of discipline however if you let it if you allow discipline to do what it's supposed to do and if you respond to the, to the discipline the way that we are to respond to the discipline it can be a blessing for you later on in life you see if we take the time to put in the work and to um, discipline our kids at a young age when they're older they become a blessing right they are a blessing to your name they're a blessing to your family they're a blessing to their family and they're a blessing to those around them you see that's the problem right um here, here is the contrast is that spiritually we have a lot of siblings that refuse to accept the discipline that God hands out right and when we do that we then make bad on his name right by the way that we live we give the name of Christ a black eye the name of Christendom a black eye why because we refuse to submit to the discipline So you look in society and you see that there there's you can tell when when parents have not done the work to discipline their children 
And I'm not talking about abuse. So please, for anybody who who um, may view this broadcast and and think that we're going straight to corporal, you know, all of that stuff, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying, because to di to discipline someone is to teach them. Right. To discipline is to teach, not to beat. To teach. OK, but if you're if you have the wrong idea of discipline. When it is administered to you, you will not receive it the way that is the way that it is intended. Therefore, because you don't receive, you will not learn. Therefore, you will repeat again. OK, if you don't receive the discipline the way that God intends for us to receive it, to allow it to either break you down and then build you back up to teach you to make the right decisions. If you don't allow it to do the work that it is supposed to do, you will repeat it again. All right. And I, and I want to be clear about this is that everybody is fair game. OK, if you belong to God, you are fair game for discipline. All right. So let's just let the scripture speak. Check this out. It says here this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. Listen, y'all, Amos is pulling no punches. He says this. He says, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness the time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks. The last of you with fish hooks. You each will go straight out through the breaks in the wall and you will be cast out toward Harmon, declares the Lord. So Amos opens up the chapter calling the women of Israel, calling them fat cows. Now, listen, again, Amos is not pulling any punches. Um, but he's making a stark contrast. And here's the contrast. The land of Bashan, they were known for producing quality livestock, really nice, really healthy, really plump, very, very good livestock. And so what Amos is showing here, because remember, the, the Israelites at this time, they are living in a moment of prosperity. Right. So everything is going well for them. This is the audience that Amos is speaking to. And so he says he calls them fat cows and he says that they use their position. Right. To oppress the poor and to crush the needy. And they say to their husbands, bring us some drinks. So here they are using whatever whether it is their beauty, their affluence, whatever it is, they're using this in a way to oppress those around them. And Amos says, everybody is fair game. And as we see in verse two, and here's why we have to pay attention when we read. And this is the beautiful thing about taking these books chapter by chapter, verse by verse is because we can skip over the fact that he says the sovereign Lord, right? Again, the Lord's sovereignty is he can do what he wants, when he wants, however he wants, through whomever he wants, for whatever purpose that he has in mind. So he is letting them know that this is what the sovereign Lord says. That because of how they are treating those around them, that there's going to be a time when they're going to be led away with hooks in their noses, with fish hooks. And they'll go out through the breaks in the wall. Now, he's speaking of when they will be um, taken over by the Assyrians. Right. And this was a method that the Assyrians used when they would lead captives out of cities. They would literally take fish hooks. They would tie them, put them in their mouths, all of this stuff, and they would lead them out. So, so humiliating. Right. If anybody has ever, if you've ever caught in a fish, right, you know that you use a hook, you use bait, right? And so when you bring the fish in, where's the fish hook? Right there in his jaw. The fish ain't going nowhere. But this is a method that the Assyrians would use. And it's crazy. It is crazy because what that, what that signals to the people is, is that they've taken the bait. 
Okay. All right. So many of us, we have, we have allowed our hearts to get so hardened to the place that there are things that are set before us, right? And because our hearts are so hardened, because we are so set in our ways, we are so set on wanting to do what we want to do. We have bitten the bait. And now the bait has become, although it may have tasted good for a second, right? Because fish, you don't see the hook, right? You don't see the hook. If you put enough bait on there, enough worm, all I'm focused on is the worm. I'm focused on what I want, right? Who cares that I'm taking the risk of there being a hook in my mouth? Now, forget that. Give me what I want. And because you have wanted what you have wanted, you are living like a fat, luscious cow. Again, this is the scripture speaking, right? You are living in such a way you don't even realize that you've bitten the, you've bitten the bait. You've taken the bait. And now you've got a hook in your mouth. And so he's going to allow the Assyrians to lead these people out just like fish on a hook who have taken the bait and the bait here's the bait ladies and gentlemen because remember i read proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 to guard our hearts right it is the pride pride is the bait okay pride is the bait the lord tells them and we'll go read it here in just a moment. But he, he constantly reminds them the book of Deuteronomy is called um, the theme of that book is remember, remember, remember. Right. The memoirs of Moses and his wanderings with the children of Israel. Remember what happens when your heart gets too proud and you begin to forget about the Lord. You see, the, the pride has led these women and again, I'm only saying women because the scripture is pointing out women, okay? Has led them to misuse whatever position they have, right? To oppress the poor and to crush the needy. All right, let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving. Verse 4 says this. It says, go to Bethel and sin go to gilgal and sin yet more bring your sacrifices every morning your tithes every three years burn leaving bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings boast about them you israelites for this is what you love to do declares the sovereign lord now i want to point out two things about um this this section, this passage of scripture. And uh, so that point that I want to make is just this. Ugly heart, ugly offering equals unaccepted. Ugly heart, ugly offering equals unaccepted. So he tells them, of course, we know Amos is speaking um, sarcastically. He tells them, he says, go to Bethel and sin, go to Gilgal and sin, yet the more now the interesting thing about these places right is so if you let's go to joshua chapter four let's go to joshua chapter four and if you guys were with us on thursday you know britain was just in joshua chapter seven so we're going to be just a few ver a few chapters um ahead of that let's see what the word of the lord has to say to us about these two places okay so let's go to Joshua chapter four. And it says this, the verse reads, it says, um, verse 19, on the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground for the Lord, your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord, your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this, that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and that you might always fear the Lord, your God. All right. OK. OK. So here it is, ladies and gentlemen. 
this place of Gilgal. There were 12 stones set up, and I just read it to you, right? You can go back and reread it again. But they set up 12 stones when they crossed the Jordan, right? So that it would serve as a memorial because he says in the future, when your descendants ask you, what do these 12 stones mean? It means this was an opportunity for the nation, for your dad, for your mom, for your grandpa, for your grandma, for your cousins, your auntie, your uncles. This was an opportunity for the nation to experience the hand of the Lord. And so do you do you see how Joshua he never he never dismissed what happened in Egypt, right? He always tied it back to the beginning. He said just as he dried up the Red Sea. Well, if you think about the Red Sea, then you got to think about why were they at the Red Sea? Well, they were at the Red Sea because they were brought out of slavery. Where were they in slavery at? They were in Egypt. What happened in Egypt? They were mistreated in Egypt. So here he is. He is connecting all of these different things, right? He's wanting the people to remember that just as God dried up the Red Sea. Here it is. He dried up the Jordan. Now we're able to cross over and now we are one step closer to what was promised in the beginning when God spoke to Abraham. And that was that I will give your descendants this land. So you see that in this moment, it is the opportunity for the people to see the consistency of God's word. That's just one place. That's Gilgal, right? Verse five, I mean, chapter five, let's see here, verses one through 10. And I won't, I, won't, I won't read them all, but let's go to verse four. And it says this, it says, now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all of the men of military age died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that they had solemnly that he had promised solemnly promised their fathers to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place and they were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, uh, they remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. Verse nine, here it is. Then the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Again, this place of Gilgal was an opportunity for the people to remember what God had done. And again, the, the last part of chapter four says that he did this. So that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you may always fear the Lord your God. But the problem is that now the very place where they are supposed to come to remember the Lord, where the pillar, the 12 stones are set up. These things have now became a place of sin and transgression. The place where they are supposed to remember and honor the Lord and fear the Lord, right? Because when seeing those 12 stones, if here's where you see the breakdown, right? The breakdown of people not continuing to tell the truth about what God had done for Israel, right? Because if you had people continuing to tell the truth on a mass level, right? If the kings were doing what they were supposed to, if the priests were doing what they were supposed to, then everybody would always know, hey, when we see this place, this is what this means. So this means because I see these 12 stones, oh, that reminds me of when they crossed the Jordan. That also reminds me of when he dried up the Red Sea. That also reminds me of the power that God put on display. But it hadn't. It had become a place of sin. And Genesis chapter 28 um, speaks of when Jacob was um, wrestling with the Lord about the land of Bethel, 
where he set up an altar. So let's look at that. Chapter 28, verses 20 through 22. And I promise we'll we'll keep this thing moving. Uh, chapter 28. There it is. Verse 20 to 20. It says, then Jacob made a vow. Let's back up to 19, 18. Sorry. Early the next morning, uh, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured it out. Or poured out oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Again, it is another opportunity for people to remember but the place had become a place of sin so amos now that he's here and dealing with them he tells them to keep bringing um their offerings right keep bringing and i'm flipping back to my spot here in amos Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin. Yet the more. Bring your sacrifices every morning. So now we're at a place of where the people are just being, uh, doing this thing mechanically, right? There is no heart. There is no passion. Have you ever seen um, uh, with modern technology, right? You know that there's some warehouses where now there's robots who are, um, you know, they can stack boxes and all this stuff. They can uh, do line work and all that. You, you don't get anything from that, right? You don't get any passion out of it. You don't get any drive out of it. You don't get uh, any emotion. You don't get nothing, right? All you get is the work out of the robot. It just does the work, mindlessly does the work. And that's what, it hap that's what has happened to the people in this moment is that they're just mindlessly bringing offerings. Well, this is what God said we're supposed to do. So let's go ahead and bring this. Right. And the interesting thing is that he tells them, he says, uh, bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years, uh, every. Yeah, your tithes every three years. So there, he mentions this because every three years they were to bring a tithe to the Lord. You see that in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Um. But I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 14, verse 28. But he says it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what you're bringing because your heart is jacked up. Your heart is ugly. Therefore, your offering is ugly. So it doesn't matter what things you might be, quote unquote, doing for the kingdom. If your heart is in the wrong place, if your heart is um, full of impure motives, if your heart is full of sin, it doesn't matter what you bring. Your offering will be unaccepted. And that's what has happened to the people, right? Is that they just kept on, kept on, kept on living any way they wanted to. Still doing the right things. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, it's a problem in the church today. Is that we have a lot of siblings. We have a lot of believers that look the part. Everything looks good externally. You're there on Sunday mornings. You're worshiping. You're leading worship. You might even be preaching. You're saying all the right things. You're doing all the religious stuff. You're blessed. You're highly favored of the Lord. His praise shall always be on your lips. You can quote the scriptures backwards and forwards. You know how to get along in worship. You know how to get by in worship. You got the mechanics down, but there is no heart. There is no passion. There is no drive behind you. It literally is the picture of an actor showing up for the day of the play. He gets into character. He gets into his costume. He then gets into this persona of who he's supposed to be and for however long the play is whether it's an hour or it's a two or a three hour play right 
he is in character. He does not break character because if he was to break character, well, then the people would see, right? That he's not really who he's portraying himself to be. So he stays in character. But as soon as the show is over, the makeup is off. The costume is off. He goes home and he's back to being whoever he was before the play. That's a problem in the church today is that we live any kind of way that we want to. But when it's time to show up, when it's time to present an offering to the Lord, we go, we put our makeup on, we put our ties on, we put our three pieces on and we stand before the Lord with raised hands, but they're stained with dirt, with mud, with mire, because it's coming from a place that is impure. It's coming from a place that is not genuine. The place where we are together to remember what the Lord has done for us has become a place for transgression and a place for sin. Because we are simply actors on a stage. That when the service is over, when the ministry opportunity is over, we go back, we take off the makeup. We take off the suit, we take off the tie, we take off the dress, we take off everything that makes us look Christian, right? We pull all that down and we live how we want to behind closed doors. And Amos says that's a problem. So my challenge is don't just look the part, live the part. Don't just look the part, live the part. And you say, well, Aaron... How do you know that somebody's not living the part? Look at the scriptures. Look at what comes out of that person on a consistent basis. Consistency will tell you everything that you need to know. Whatever it is that you're doing consistently, that's really who you are. Not, not what you're striving to do consistently. What you do on a consistent basis as it relates to your, your relationship with the Lord, that's who you really are. And if it's not where you need to be, thank God for his grace and another opportunity to get it right. But Amos has a problem with these people again, because they're bring, they're doing the things I'm bringing my offering. I'm giving. I'm doing all this. I'm doing all that. But you can't even speak to the to your neighbor. You harbor hate against your neighbor. You won't go have a conversation. But you'll show up, you'll pay your tithe. You'll raise your hands in worship and you'll talk about how beautiful the Lord is, how wonderful God's people are, how much you love God's people, how much you love your sibling, how much you love your wife, how much you love your kids. But they don't know that. They don't see that. All right. I get off the gas. Uh, let's go to verse six. It says this. Um, I'm sorry. Verse five. I, I want to reread it. It says burn leaven bread as a thank offering. And brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do. So again, these are people who go through the mechanics, but they love to tell other people how religious they are. Do you guys see the contrast? Um, because it's a matter of the heart, right? Because this is the exact same thing that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing in Jesus's day. And Jesus called them hypocrites. Jesus said of those same people that these people honor me with their lips, right? but their hearts are far from me. So before you ever utter a word, I want to see your feet first, right? I want to see where your feet are moving before you start trying to talk to me about anything. Because if I can see the direction of your feet, then I already know how to approach you when you start running that mouth, all right? So check this out. Verse six, it says, I gave you empty stomachs in every city and a lack of... I'm sorry, and lack of bread in every town. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Have you ever been given a gift that you did not want? For instance, it is, um, let's say that you, um, you really love cake, right? And it is maybe a milestone for you. Uh, maybe it's your birthday. It's a, a joyous occasion. And instead of somebody bringing you something to compliment the cake, they may bring you a slim fast to drink. 
Now, you would look at that slim fast and you would say, how dare you? How, how dare you show up to something that is supposed to be celebratory for me and this is supposed to be a great moment for me and you give me a gift that I don't want? How dare you? Have you ever been given a gift by God that you didn't want? Be honest. You know, we can be all sanctified and say, oh, you know, he's giving me salvation. He's giving me this. He's giving me that. But what about if God gives you an empty stomach or God decides to withhold something that you need? How willing are you to accept the gift then? Verse six says again, I gave you empty stomachs in every city and a lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me. So time out, time out, pause, wait a second. You're telling me, God's telling us, God's telling the people through Amos that those moments when you were hungry and you were looking for bread, I'm the one who gave you empty stomachs. When you were trying to figure out how in the world am I going to eat, I feel like I'm going to starve to death, right? God said, I'm the one that gave that to you. I'm the one that gave you a lack of bread. Now, why would the Lord, knowing that I need to eat, why would there be a lack of bread? Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold, now, wait, wait a minute, Lord. You said that you would provide all my needs according to your riches and glory. Now, why, why come my needs ain't being met? Can I, let, let's answer the question. Because you've forgotten who it is that provides your needs. You've forgotten whose hand it is that actually feeds you. You have forgotten where your substance comes from. You have forgotten who your source is. So therefore, God says, I gave you empty stomachs and a lack of bread. I allowed you to go without, yet you still have not returned to me. He tells them in Deuteronomy chapter eight. Let's look at this, what the Lord says. He says, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither nor your you nor your fathers had known to teach to teach you that man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of the lord and then the lord goes on to remind them that their clothes did not wear out their shoes did not wear out they um that he kept them safe from danger and all of these different things but again he allowed these things to happen so that they would know that we don't live just by what we can see we don't live just by uh just on bread alone but we learn to live on every word that comes from the mouth of god therefore before it's time for you to eat bread have you been eating of his word before it's time to work that diet right how is your diet in the scriptures you see, because had they been in the scriptures or had they been following the Lord the way that they're supposed to when those things happen. Well, now, as Brenton pointed out on um, Thursday in Joshua chapter seven, Joshua was tearing his clothes. He was tripping. Hey, man, what's going on, Lord? What is happening? And it was like, hey, 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 there's sin in the camp. There's a problem in the camp. Now you need to go trace that. That's what we can do when we live close to the scriptures, ladies and gentlemen. When things happen in our lives, when things begin to go wrong, things are not working out the way that, we, that they should. We can begin to start doing some. We can start doing some tracing, right? 
and saying, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you said that you would provide my needs, my needs are not being met. What's happening here? There's a common denominator. It is when you and I walk in disobedience that if God has to, he will withhold the very things that you need in order to get your attention. Exactly. Exactly. Jesus was hungry. He needed food. And he says, I don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of my father. And so the Lord lets them know that he he let them go hungry on purpose. Again, this is a gift. This is a gift that nobody wants. Nobody wants this gift. But you may need this gift to remind you of who's really in charge. <laughs> My Lord, verse seven says this. I'm sorry, before we move on, we have to understand that true life comes through his word. And here's here's why I say that. I say that because it is his word that teaches us how to navigate through life. It teaches us what decisions to make, what decisions not to make. Right. He teaches us how to navigate so that when we are faced with opportunities to be disobedient or to be obedient, because we understand him, we under because, again, he's made the statement of himself several times in the book of Amos and even twice today in this chapter or once today for sure, that he is the sovereign Lord. We understand his sovereignty, that God can do what he wants to do, however he chooses to do it, through whomever he chooses to do it. Because we understand that, we understand that if we want to experience, and I'm not talking about success as America paints it, no, success as a believer, quality life as a believer, We do that through living in obedience to him and his word. Success as a believer is just one definition of mine is being able to be the best representation of him that you can be while on earth. That's success. Living a life that points others to Jesus Christ. That's success as a believer. That's winning as a believer. Being able to show your family what it looks like to serve Jesus. And again, a gift you may not may not want, but it is one that you may need. You may not. Again, going back to my my story, that's not a true story. It's just an example, right? Um, you may not want the slim fast right now. But if. You're unhealthy. You may be overweight. Or whatever. Jump the scenario however you may want to do it. The gift may not make sense at that moment. May offend you at that moment. But later on, it might be good for you. Right? My doctor gives me a gift every week. And it's a gift that I don't want. And it's these types of, these specific types of drinks that I have to drink in order for my skin to stay healthy and my my skin doesn't break down due to, you know, sitting for long periods of time and things like that. And every week never fails. She's sending a gift home with me. Hey, I got I got some more of this drink for you. And it's not a gift I want, ladies and gentlemen, but it is a gift that I have seen. To be proven as effective in my life in my quality of life and in my health. So I'm saying the same thing with God allowing things to go wrong for you might be a gift that you may not think that you need a gift you may not want but later on down the road it's going to benefit you let's keep moving verse 7 says this i also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away i sent rain on one town but withheld it from another one field had rain another had none one dried up People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me. 
Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig tree, your fig and olive trees, yet you have not returned to me. Remember in Joel, when we opened up the book, that's literally what Joel was talking about. He was talking about how locusts had came and destroyed the city. And so we see here, right, that God has no problem whatsoever making these things happen. All right. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse 14, uh, look at this. It says this. It says you will be blessed. Oh, sorry. I was in chapter seven. It says, verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and you and all you have is multiplying, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This is the problem when we become comfortable, when we become proud, when we allow our heart to become comfortable with the blessings of the Lord. The people have allowed themselves to become comfortable. They're, they've eaten. They've been satisfied. They've had their feel. Everything is going well for them. And so because everything is going well for them. Their first responsibility, which is to love the Lord, their God. With all of their heart, with all of their mind, with all of their strength. That goes out the window. Because now we are comfortable in the relationship. May we never get to a place and we've all been there. I, I've been there. Um, on several occasions where um, you just get comfortable, right? You begin to get lax in your devotion because everything's going well for you. The job's good. The family's good. Everything is going the way that, that you desire for it to go as a result of God's blessing on your life. But then your devotion time gets lax. Your reading of the scriptures gets lax. Your living out of the scriptures gets lax. So God says, hold on, hold on, hold on. Your responsibility is to me first. But we flip it and we begin to give priority to the blessing when priority should be given to the blesser. And so, again, we see here that he says that I was I withheld rain from you. Harvest was still three months away, three months of growing that could still happen. And God shut the rain down again. At this moment, he is showing us his sovereignty and and here and here it is, ladies and gentlemen, is that when we see the statement, yet you have not returned to me, you really see how hardened the people's hearts have become. Because remember, at the beginning, I mentioned that if you do not view discipline the right way, meaning if you view when God chooses to discipline you, if you view it as punishment, if you view it as God being mean, as God does not love you, if you buy the lie of the enemy, because what the enemy is going to tell you. Enemy's going to say, God doesn't love you because if God loved you, that wouldn't happen to you. What kind of loving God would treat you like this? What type of loving God would allow you to go hungry? What type of loving God would allow this, this, and this, and this? And so when we buy the lie of the enemy, we begin projecting that on God, saying, God, you don't love me. God, you don't care about me, because if you cared about me, you wouldn't have let my mama die. You wouldn't let my daddy die. You wouldn't have allowed this to happen. You would not have allowed that to happen. So because of this and because of that, you don't love me. When all the time. God, as a father, continuing to stay consistent and not leave when you start acting up. But choosing to stay consistent with you discipline an opportunity to teach you if you don't view that the right way you'll miss the whole purpose of discipline and again it is for God to teach us to walk in the way that we are supposed to walk it's about obedience not perfection 
because we are his image bearers and it is our responsibility in the world to show people what he looks like. And before your comfort, before your convenience, before all of those, diff all whatever, stack it up, write your list out before all of that. We are called to be disciples. We are called to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from him. So that we can in turn teach other people to do the same. And we have to come to a place of understanding. A place of understanding our our place when it comes to the Lord. And we ain't equal. We don't we don't demand things of him as though God works for us. We may try it, but it doesn't work. As Psalm 30 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to him and everything can be used as a teaching moment. Even the things that you need to survive. The fact that he says that he can, he sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. They staggered from town to town. They couldn't find enough to drink. It's all his doing. Verse 10 says, I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me. Verse 11 says, I overthrew some of you as I did as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me. You barely escaped, as he says, as a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me. And so I pray that we are not, that our hearts never get to the place where the Lord really has to proverbially turn up the heat in our lives to get our attention. And ways to avoid that is to walk in submission to the Holy Spirit and in obedience to the word of the Lord. Ways to avoid that is to not elevate what God has blessed us with more to not prioritize those things more than we are prioritizing him to always keep the Lord in his proper place. That no matter how good it gets, no matter how successful you become in this life, no matter how much you amass, no matter what your possessions may look like, your materials may look like all of these things that we never forget just how good the Lord has been to me. That's why, um, you know, we, we are all typically playing songs before, um, we began to minister. And when I came across that song, Jesus, 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 again, there's so much in that name. First of all, he is our savior. Second of all, he is our friend. He is our counselor. He is everything that we need him to be and more. May we never forget. Because when we when we begin to buy the lies of the enemy. You see, I, I want to go back just very, very quickly. Um, the play when it said, go to Bethel and sin in verse four. What had happened is that you guys remember Jeroboam, right? Jeroboam, that is where he set up that altar when the kingdom was splitting. And he said, man, if I don't do something, these people are going to return back to the kingdom. Right. So I have to put something in place in order to keep the people here. And people began to buy the lie because he began to tell them that these are the guys that brought you out of Egypt. You see, if we're not careful. That was a very emotional moment for the kingdom. Right. People were being and that's when the enemy tries to get you, ladies and gentlemen, is when emotions are high, when things are maybe chaotic in your life. When things may be going wrong or or there may be upsets happening just this week, just this week, from Sunday to today, I found myself in a situation where the enemy was very close to just sifting me like wheat because I was in a moment where emotions were high. 
and I was getting ready to make a decision, but the decision I was going to make could have been a costly one, could have been one that was not good later on down the road. But we've got to be careful, right? In those moments when things are, emotions are high, tensions are high, it, it may be chaotic, right? That we remember the word of the Lord. And this is the, this is the importance of living close to the scriptures so that when we find ourselves in those moments of of chaos where there is an absence of peace that we say like the prophet that you will keep me in perfect peace because my eyes are stayed on you so things may be chaotic it may be a tough spot but if I make the decision to keep my eyes focused on you you will be my peace and therefore I'm able to navigate the way that I need to navigate and so may we not forget ladies and gentlemen may we heed his voice so that we don't have to experience his hand but if we do experience his hand, wherever, wherever the text may find you today, if you are in a moment of experiencing God's discipline, understand that he is trying to teach you how to depend on him and him only. Because these systems, at times, they're going to fail you. Friendships will fail you at times. Some of your relationships will fail you at times. Your job will fail you at times. The government will fail you at times. All these other things have the propensity to fail you at times. And if your dependence relies on them, when it's no longer there, you're in shambles and you're lost. You are untethered from the world and you don't know how in the world you're going to keep it together. That is why, again, we don't live by bread alone, but we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Brenton and I were joking about this the other day, but, but it, it's the truth, right? This journey that we're on, this is the real Route 66. Not the, not the historic, the legendary route that you drive. No, this is it. Route 66. 66 books. It's a lifetime journey. I want to close with verse 13. It says, uh, verse 12 and 13, Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel, and because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. So now, here it is, the challenge, right? Because you fail to listen, because you fail to um Return to me. Now you're really going to meet me. I'm really going to show you who I am on a greater level. So you're going to get to know the Lord one way or the other. Right. You, you can you can meet him as a challenge, as a boxer steps into the ring to challenge his opponent. You can meet him that way because you've been a fight with him. And he'll he'll let you see him that way or. You can meet him in a place to where he doesn't have to go through all of this to get your attention. But he says this. He says, he who forms the mountains, creates the wind and reveals his thoughts to man. He who turns dawn to darkness and tread to the high places of the earth. The Lord God Almighty is his name. And I, I really love the ending of this because we, we saw him in the characteristic of sovereignty. Right. As all these things were happening. But now, at the end of the chapter, you, you get the opportunity to view him as the Lord God Almighty, meaning the Lord God over every single thing. Even as bad as you may think you are, right? As stubborn as you think you are, he is greater. All right. So. Um, let us pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Um, God, I thank you for speaking clearly. 
And God, I thank you that you are our peace in times of chaos. I thank you, Lord, for the great links that you will go through. And God, to get your children's attention. Uh, as parents, we always say that there is nothing that we will not do for our children. And sometimes, Lord, it's hard to be consistent in disciplining because, you know, you, you get wrapped up in the emotions. You see, um, you know, how it affects them and all of these different things. But, you know, as a parent, that what you're doing in the long run, although they may not see it right now, will be better for them. And so, God, I pray that you help us to take that same principle that we apply in our parenting and see that and see you in that way, God, that sometimes we're just not doing we're not listening. And and you, you got to turn the heat up a little bit on us. You've got to discipline. You've got to teach us. To stop relying on everything else, stop that, stop being so proud because we're hey, we're not that good. As Isaiah said, that our, our righteousness is as filthy rags to you. And it's only because your son, Jesus. God, that we are able to stand before you. And so I pray, God, that we would approach you with humble hearts, not with a haughty attitude and a haughty spirit, thinking that we are better than what we are. Just because we may have a house, nice cars, we may be a little bit more spiritually mature than somebody else. May we never forget, God, where it is that you have brought us from. The things that you have done for us, the places you have delivered us from. The power that you have shown to us. May we forever remain humble. In a position to learn never to stand up as though we're equal with you, God, but to always sit and submit to what it is that you have to say. I pray for Marcus. I pray for Brenton, God. Uh, I thank you for using us, Lord in this time, in this season that we find ourselves. And God, that you would give them the words that they are to speak, that they are to utter. Lord, we're just three sheep herders, proverbially. Mine and our business. But God, you've given us an opportunity to share the truth and we shall do so. Father, thank you for those that support us. Bless them, keep them. May your face shine upon them. Be gracious to them, Lord, and give them your peace. In Jesus' name. Hey Amen. All right. Love you guys. I appreciate y'all uh, for being on this morning. A little, little few minutes late and a few minutes long, but um, I pray that you were encouraged. I pray that you were blessed. I pray that you were strengthened. And again, God loves you, right? We can't just claim that God loves us when things are going well, but even when things are going wrong, he still loves us. It just may look a little bit different. All right. So you guys have a great Tuesday. We're looking forward to hearing from Marcus tomorrow um, in Amos chapter five. And then we'll hear from at 715 a.m. And then we'll hear from Brenton on Thursday at 7 a.m. in um, Amos chapter six. All right. So you guys have a great day and we'll holler at you later. Peace. Oh, one more thing before I say peace. If you guys have an opportunity, I believe it is tonight at six. Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Um, Valerie, uh, Aunt Val, as we like to call her, she Pearls of Wisdom is on at 6 p.m. And so you guys be sure to um, to hop on their support. Um, again, just another opportunity for us to um, be in the scriptures and to learn from one another. All right. You guys have a great night. Peace. Great day. Sorry. <laughs>